Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 118 of Swimsuit by James Patterson and Maxine P. So let's get right into this video. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, I suggest you click off the video now. You have been warned. Switzerland. Two cops were in the front seat and I sat in the back of a car speeding toward Wagen, a toy like Alpine town in the shadow of the eager. Despite the ban on cars and the idyllic ski resort, our armored vehicle twisted around the narrow and icy roads. I clenched my armrest and leaned forward and stared straight ahead. I wasn't afraid that the car would sail over a guardrail. I was afraid that we wouldn't go get to Horse Warner in time. Van Tuvel's computer computer had yielded his contact list and in addition to the complete playlist of Henry Bonnaz's videos, I turned over my transcript of Henry's confessions in the trailer. I'd explained to the police the connection between Henry Benoit, serial killer for Heil, and the people who paid him. The cops were elated. Henry's trail of victims, dozens of horrific killings in Europe and America and Asia had been linked only since for the recent murders of two young women in Barbados. Now the Swiss police were optimistic that with the right kind of pressure, Horse Warner would give up Henry. As we sped toward Warner's Villa, law enforcement agents were moving in on members of the Alliance in countries around the world. These should have been triumphant hours for me, but I was in a state of raw panic. I made calls to friends, but there were no phones where Amanda was staying. I didn't know if it would be hours or days before I would know if she was safe, and although Van Hoevel had referred to Henry as a toy, I had more evidence than before of his rubbish, ruthlessness, his resourcefulness, his lust for revenge, and I finally understood why Henry had drafted me to write his book. He wanted the Alliance, his puppeteers, to be caught so that he could be free of them, to change his identity again and lead his own life. The car I was riding in braked wheels shimmering on ice and gravel, the heavy vehicle sliding to a stop at the foot of a stone wall. The wall fronted a for fortress-like compound built into the side of a hill. Car doors opened and slammed, radios chattered, armed commando units flanked us, dozens of men in flak jackets were, who were armed with automatic weapons, grenade launchers, and high-tech equipment I couldn't even name. Fifty yards away, across a snowy field, glass shattered. A window had been knocked out of the corner room of the villa. Bullets flew and grenades boomed as they exploded inside the target area. Under, cover, cu under covering fire, a dozen agents charged the villa, and I heard the rumble of snow crackling loose up from the steep grade behind horse stronghold. There was shouting and German, more small arms fire, and I visualized Horse Warner's dead body coming out on a stretcher, the final act of his takedown. With Horse Warner dead, how would we find Henry? The massive front door opened, the men who were leaning against the wall aimed their weapons, and then I saw him, Horse Warner, the terror, who... Van Hoevel had described as a man with long arms and steel fists, the last man you'd ever want to meet, came out of his house of stone. He was barrel-chested with a goatee and a gold wire framed glasses, and he wrote, wore a blue overcoat. Even with his hands folded on the top of his head, he had a confident military bearing. This was the twisted man behind it all, the master voyeur, the murderous murderer, the wizard of, the, of some hellacious perverted Oz. He was alive, and he was under arrest. That is the end of this chapter. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!